Hi, greetings and welcome. Welcome back. Um, if you've been following my vlog, the Flood Fishing Masterclass, then uh, um, some people have been waiting for this section. Uh, as I said, I've already discussed the, the rudiments of waggler fishing, uh, stick float fishing and running water floats fishing. Now I'm going to talk about uh, pole floats uh, fishing. Um, and at the end then I'll talk about commercial pole floats as well. Now the reason why uh, I've left this to last is because um, pole float fishing now is is uh, the most popular form uh, of fishing. You know, um, I, I've done a, a poll lately on the uh, match fishing group, and um, and it, uh, to my surprise, um, uh, pole pole uh, pole fishing has become one of the most popular of all um, uh, uh, methods now. So uh, that 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 was very interesting. Now what I want to do, I want to first of all talk a little bit about the history of pole floats and um, how we got to learn about pole, pole fishing and pole floats in particular. I think, I think it was 1981 when um, France uh, they actually won the World Championships uh, in England on their own water um, fishing a pole, you know. Um, 1981 was the year. Uh, England obviously was second and we were third um, Wales but um, the interesting fact was that uh, up until then all the world championships before had all been you know m um, had been won using the pole so um, as I say it was a bit of an eye-opening and it was something that I think we all you know sort of either have to learn if we were going to compete at that sort of level um, I think up till then, um, there was an exception, of course, when Ian Heaps won on the sliding waggler. But uh, as I already discussed, sometimes the sliding uh, float can out outfish a pole. But more often than not, pole fishing uh, really is the master tool, you know, to catch fish. So, um, you know, so that was when we started uh, in 1981 to start to take notice. And uh, this is where we all had to, had to learn about pole floats. Yeah, just a couple of things before I, I go on to it. Um, uh, recently, I was talking to Bob Nudd, and Bob Nudd was telling me that, um, you know, back in uh, the early age, uh, early stages of uh, the pole float uh, development, um, he was an average angler who, uh, you know, just competed. Um, but he concentrated on, on pole float and pole fishing. And... Um, because of his ability, uh, he, um, he he sort of outshone a lot of the old guard anglers, if you like, and he went on to win the world championships four times. And it was all down to the fact of learning how to fish the pole uh, and the methods. Um, and also, I remember um, after coming uh, silver medalist in the world championships, on the first day I had the, the top weight of 17 pound using a pole. Um, and a pole float again on running water and I'll discuss that a little bit later on uh, as we go through this now uh, this part of the series but it was interesting because uh, I remember doing a feature with um, a chap named uh, Chris Taylor um, now Chris um, was one of the top Midland uh, waggle anglers um, and he was winning a lot of matches at the time up on the Wallace Raven well anyway um, we were asked to do a feature because we were both sponsored by the same company, uh, you know, Aiken, you know, Bayer Fishing Line. And I think it was Kevin Wilmot from the Anglin Times who decided that, um, uh, you know, he'd come along and do a feature with us. And anyway, uh, Chris fished his uh, waggler and, uh, and I fished a pole, you know, um, and it was interesting because I actually beat Chris the next peg, you know, uh, head to head, um, fishing a pole. And I made a statement, probably very underestimated at the time. I said to Kevin uh, Wilmot, you know, in the Anglian Times, I said, uh, I said, you know, uh, one day um, some matches will, uh, will be won on a pole. <laughs> what an understatement, because now this day and age, you know, pole, 90% uh, of the time are winning the matches. Anyway, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about that and how, um, I, you know, the reason why I got into pole, float, pole floats and pole float fishing, because, um, you know, it was the way forward. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about um, the basics of a pole float. Now, the reason um, uh, 
pole floats are so successful and uh, why they work so well is because most of them are aerodynamically shaped, you know, for a particular venue or a particular water that you're fishing. Plus the pole itself, because um, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it's a fact that you can fish a float that's small, that's small, at 13 or 14 meters. Um, and a float that small could be so sensitive uh, the fish just, you know, don't have a chance. And with a pole over the top of them, with just inches to the float, you know, hitting a fish is much more simpler than if you're fishing a rod and line. Um, of course, you couldn't fish a, a, a small float that size, you know, sort of half a gram with a rod and line at 13 or 14 meters. So this is where the advantage, as I say, of the pole comes into its own and um, obviously fishing the right type of pole float. Now the basic design on a pole float I'm going to show you is actually uh, what I call a pear shape. Yeah, so um, so the basic shape, as I said, of a of a of a, uh, a pole float, it starts off as a pear shape. Now pear shape, um, some people call it a teardrop, but I I um, I'll refer to it as a pear. Now this is a standard pear shape, and the reason uh, why this is so successful is because of the nature of the taper of the body. As it's aerodynamically shaped, it's shaped in such a way that further up the float becomes more sensitive. So when you shot this float, the, um, the displacement of the body in the water is reduced. And as the, as the float is shot down, it becomes more sensitive. Now, that's a basic, if you like, design of a float. Now, the pole float itself, as I said, comes in many different shapes. Now, if you were to reverse that, you then got what we call a reverse pair. Now, a reverse pair then comes into its own, as that, as you can see, that now performs like a shoulder. Okay, and this then uh, becomes ideal uh, for like running water um, and for holding back. But again, I'll be discussing that. Uh, as we go through the, the pole floats and, uh, and their various applications and, and designs. Okay, right, now um, I'm going to start off, I think, uh, as the basic um, pear shape float, uh, which is normally atoned uh, to what we call a still water venue. Yet, um, it can still be used in running water uh, under certain circumstances. Now the aerodynamically shaped of the float allows it to sink very easily. Uh, the tapering shape reduces its weighting capacity greatly, as you can see. Therefore, the float is best used when on running water, when it's overshotted and held back, and with the help of the pole against the flow, and adding more weight to counterbalance the heavy toe. So in other words, the, the, the faster the waters go in, uh, the more shot you actually put on it to hold it back. Now, this float is a very sensitive approach that shows a bite indication with the slightest pressure on the line below. Um, this float makes this float sink very easily when you get a bite. And as I said, the constant pressure of water is required when you're using this float. So you're basically in control uh, of the float at all times. Okay, so to get this right, <laughs> um, the angler, when he's uh, in control of this float, um, as I said, by holding it back against th the flow, uh, if, the f if the angler relaxes the line to the float, then it will obviously sink. So the balance, you've got to get the balance right. So you're just basically holding it just above the water. Now this comes with trial and error, of course. So let's say this was a, uh, I don't know, um, say a five gram float. Then uh, you would put your five gram bulk down. And of course, then you'd have your couple of um, tail shots. And you would uh, add weight to it so that you, you can hold the float quite comfortably against the flow as it's traveling 
down the water. And now, as I've already explained about uh, the surface uh, skim of a river, it, 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 you know, it goes faster on the top than it does on the bottom. So this makes it perfect uh, balance, which gives you, as I say, the control over the float. Now, um, developing this um, float, uh, I remember fishing a match on the River Drava in Yugoslavia, and that was a very um, deep, deep um, venue. It was eight, 18 foot, in fact, 18 foot deep. And um, I developed this method, if you like, so that um, I had to I almost double the amount of weight. So say a five gram was a 10 gram down. And that way I could control the float, as I said, to go through the water. And this is where we learned, I learned, you know, we learned this obviously from continental anglers. And uh, uh, I remember that match because uh, we were catching these sturvets and uh, what we call cigar fish, <laughs> Kevin Ashes uh, coined a phrase on these fish. And um, as I say, I was uh, unlucky that I lost a couple of fish on that uh, particular uh, match that uh, could have quite possibly, you know, been in the medals. But anyway, that's another story. But as I said, the development of this float um, uh, basically, um, you know, came from when we used to fish these type of heavy waters. However, uh, the French, <laughs> they used a different method. They, um, uh, if you like, undershotted it, so it became quite buoyant in the water. Uh, in other words, half the body was still out of the water. And what they would do then, they would plunge the tip of their pole under the water and hold the float back that way. And of course, when they got a bite, it was probably a bit more uh, positive than it would if you were holding it uh, undershotted. So that was quite an interesting method. In fact, I'll uh, I'll show you a little diagram now. <laughs> now, so if you look at that, you see the diagram there with the bulk down, and you can see the, uh, the pole line on the top holding the float against the flow. And that's the traditional way of doing it. However, the French clever. That's how they use. That's how they done it. They basically make sure the, the it was proud, and they put their pole t uh, tip under the water. So when you had a bite, say, same shot in pattern, but a different application of the float would work. As I say, it's in the manual. So <laughs> if you uh, you can either go to the website or you can buy the manual, and it explains it far greater on there. I'm going to show you. Uh, uh, this is a water queen float. And basically, um, as you can see, it's still a pear-shaped, but it's a far squatter body. And uh, this is the type of float that the, uh, you know, that the, the French were using on that particular day. Now, this um, method comes into its own, obviously, on, uh, again, with running water. And, um, as I say, by undershotting it, um, holding the pole under the water, that how it, that's how it worked. Um, of course, it would have to be a very uh, strong flowing river, you know, to be able to um, use this method. Uh, are there many rivers in this country like that? I don't know. There might be a couple. Uh, but uh, I just thought I'd quickly show you that. Now, this one is a wire stem, uh, bossa body. Uh, they also come in polystyrene bodies these days, of course. Um, uh, also, um, nylon tips. And we also use hollow nylon tips as well. Um, and cane, you can use cane. As a, a very, um, uh, depends on the, uh, if you like, the sensitivity of the tip uh, is how you want it. And that's, that's, um, that's basically how we design that type of float. Yeah, I'll just quickly show you, if, um, if you like, the, uh, the shot in. So basically, if we're looking at, um, well, it's quite deep. This is uh, 18 foot. Um, and you've got your Olivet down, and I think you've got uh, number sixes and tens between the Olivet and the, and the hook. Uh, this, uh, by doing it, by shotting that way, it's almost like an instant setting float. Then, when you when you put your float, uh, your pole float out, and it goes, to, you know, obviously into the river, it um, it's almost uh, fishing straight away. Of course. Uh, if you ball it in, which most people do, um, you, what you do, you cover an area of, uh, of um, at the bottom with the bait. You set a trap, and then obviously you just inch your float 
over the uh, the baited area and that's how it works okay so those are the uh, basic um, shapes of the, as I say of the pair um, which uh, can be used mainly uh, which is are mainly used on still water however um, it, they, they also have the application on running water usually in fast water where uh, you need to just uh, overshot it slightly to hold it back no I'm going to show you uh, the, uh, the opposite now this is um this is the reverse pair now as you can see the shape is uh, altered now the shoulder is on the top and um, as I say this float is shaped perfectly as I said for holding back against the flow because of the shoulder um, now the French anglers uh, first developed um, this these sort of floats for the heavy waters you know on the Rhine etc and now um, but now used uh, on a lot of the uh, uh, big rivers, uh, you know, especially ho home countries, you know, uh, in in UK, you know, we use these sort of pole floats um, uh, regardless of the flow, whether it's a very fast flow or whether it's a medium flow or even a slow flow. Uh, because again, what you do, you shot it down to the tip. Uh, so you've got the shoulder, so you've got the current that runs over the top of it, so you can hold it back very nicely. And again, you can control, um, if you like, the uh, uh, you know the, the pace of this float along the water. Now, the eye, uh, which is just on the shoulder, just above there, um, and that, that basically um, allows it, you to control if you like the float uh, from there you've got the eye and then you've got your rubber from there one in the middle don't forget the one in the middle and one on the bottom this has got a cane stem but they come in carbon or wire wire stems uh, uh, usually carbon is about the most uh, uh, pliable uh, although wire gives it more, a bit more stability but then less uh, weight down down um, now Another way you can use this float is uh, a laying on technique as well. So um, instead of, um, if you like, dead depth, you can actually lay it on. So you can actually, um, as you say, swing it out in front of you. So the, uh, the, 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 the bottom shots lay on the, on the deck of the riverbed and you can hold it back that way. And that's a very good way of inching it down the swim course making sure you got a clear bottom because if it's got a snaggy bottom then you will snag up on it as I say um, uh, again bristles they come in uh, nylon uh, hollow uh, plastic or you can cane um, or sometimes uh, uh, well I'll be talking about uh, more sensitive floats later on where we use uh, wire but uh, in this case we just use a nylon or, or a cane tip yeah, just quickly show you the shotting pattern. Again, um, you know, that's six foot deep there, but uh, anywhere between six, ten, twelve foot um, is ideal. I'm going to show you another one. I'll show you a diagram of this one. Uh, and basically, it's, a, it's a, um, a reverse pair, but it's got a bigger shoulder. Okay, and the reason why we use this with a bigger shoulder is the application on this is that once it's very very fast flowing then this will uh, because of the shoulder will give you a better uh, control uh, over it you know if you overshot it slightly but also another method you can use it if i show you that you can actually use like a, a link ledger as well and yet that will hold the float perfectly still in the water so that's another technique that you can use uh, as i said this is what we call the big Big, big wide uh, shoulder float. Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, you can spread the shots uh, rather, uh, or you can bulk it. Uh, this floats a bit squatter, um, and the reason being, obviously, uh, with a harder shoulder for holding back uh, a lot easier. Okay, so the squatter the float, uh, the more for holding back, the longer the body, more for trotting it through, uh, which I'll I'll explain that now. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the um, long pair with a shoulder. Okay, and this one again is spread out. And because of the long body, uh, this uh, float is, is uh, better for sort of trotting it through. Um, I can tell you that uh, this float I used uh, when I won the South of England Pole 
uh, championships on the uh, Bristol Avon. Um, I was loose feeding hemp and maggots, and um, I uh, won the match with 17 pound. You have got them. Um, I'm just making up a couple now. There's one there. See, so you can see it's a long body, very long body, in fact, with the shoulder, bristle, and I got a carbon stem. Okay, again, it's a lovely float, um, available on my website. <laughs> um, Yeah, as I said, so, you know, th this particular float, um, it's uh, it's good for fishing, sort of quite, quite reasonable deep swims, um, spreading the shot out, a shirt button, and holding it back. Um, however, uh, I've got another float now, which is very similar, and that's a longer, um, it's what I call a long body uh, float. And this one, um, Obviously, you don't hold back with this one. This one, you trot through the water, more like a stick float uh, on the pole. Uh, you can long line it, and um, it's a lovely float. And this one has won me um, a few matches uh, on the Bristol Avon. Um, I'll ask you a year before I was third in a, in a, in a open, um, loose feed and hemp, and, and fishing this, and just trundling this through, you know, sort of um, up the bottom, and, you know, with a string of small... Uh, BBs, uh, sorry, small, <laughs> got to get this right, tens, I'm sorry, uh, tens and uh, eights and tens down the line, reducing in size, and um, as I say, uh, it's a lovely float. Again, available on the website, um, and more illustrations, obviously in the manual, explaining how I uh, shot it and um, tackled it up. Okay, now the, the next float I'm going to show you is an oval float. Uh, now, an oval, again, uh, for trotting. And this particular float, um, uh, it, this is the float that, that I um, use when I actually came, um, um, well, when I was second in the World Championships. On the first day, I won it, £17, and I used this, the split Olivet method. Um, I don't know if you can see the diagram there. Yeah, so basically how it works is that um, uh, on this river, Rhine, it was flowing through quite um, pacey and um, obviously you needed to slow it down. So uh, you'd have your bulk, obviously, down the bottom. Then you'd have a, a couple of um, shots preceding it so you can hold it back. As soon as the flow stopped with the turbines, they would stop the flow. It, the float would slow up. Trouble is, you wouldn't get a bite. So the only way I would get a bite is with the Olivets, I'd have two together, and I'd uh, move one right up the line up underneath the float, so that lighter Olivet would catch any flow that was still present in the water. That way, um, I, I would get bites and I'd catch the fish. And that's uh, that year, uh, done tremendously well. Fishing, first success I had, fishing the pole in the World Championships, um, I was I said top weight beating all the English boys and no Welsh boys. In fact, uh, our team comes six that year because we had a good little uh, um, team plan. Uh, uh, England didn't get anywhere, so. <laughs> but what a fantastic uh, float this is for, um, as I say, for moving running water, whether it's um, you know medium to fast or slow. Okay, the next float I'm going to show you. Now this is a uh, something different that uh, you may not have seen before. Um, this float goes back to um, 1980, and this was uh, used by the German team um, with great effect. In fact, uh, that particular year, um, they absolutely uh, trounced everyone using this float. Um, it's called a German barrel float, and um, if you can imagine, the water was so flowing th uh, through so strong. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, I've got them, got the diagram. And I got the float there. Um, yeah, it was, uh, that's right, uh, 1980, uh, Germany. It was on the, the Mannerham Canal. And um, as I said, it was flowing, it was 18 foot deep. Uh, and it was flowing, uh, flowing, and but full of bream. And the Germans, uh, they won every section. Um, and so they had seven penalty points, I think. That's right. That's right. So the, out of uh, possible five. So they, they won, uh, I think, um, nearly every section bar from one who, who was about third. So fantastic result. And they used this float to great effect. 
Um, where you can use it uh, in UK, I'm not sure, but um, I had been uh, had been playing around and making uh, one or two up. Uh, there's one there just to the start of it. Um, see the eye? The eyes in the middle of the body. Okay, and the idea is, uh, so see, it's like a battle, like a battle float, and. As I say, it's fully fully illustrated in the uh, on the website, or say you know if you want to uh, invest in a, one of these manuals. Um, uh, so basically, uh, bolt down. Um, now this is the other thing. Um, this is where they they had, um, uh, if you like, uh, a trick up their sleeve because with this flowing water, it's flowing through so hard. Um, you would imagine a battle float just wouldn't. Um, it would just pull the you know your, your bait out and lift up in the water so what they done cleverly they lifted above the water level and as you can see on that illustration they basically watched the float uh for it to move uh, without going under of course it just you know and that would detect a bite and um that's how they caught their fish and they uh and that was the uh, kremkus one um uh, Krampus did go in, uh, go on to win it again. Uh, Wolfgang Krampus uh, sadly passed away last year. But uh, what a great angler, what a great team, and what a great method. So you yeah, that's uh, that's another float that uh, you never know. You, one day you might might need to use it um, in the UK. Now the next float is actually actually uh, a very small version uh, of the barrel float, but um, uh, it's actually got a shoulder on it. Uh, and we call it the wine bottle float. Sadly, I haven't got any to show you. I haven't made any yet, but I can show you on the illustration. Yeah, what we did make them, and um, basically, it's if you look at it, it's, it's almost like a wine bottle with a collar. Now, these are uh, obviously smaller floats, so they're like a gram, gram and a half. The first time I seen one of these being used was funny enough, was by Bob Nudd uh, fishing on the uh, home internationals. Um, and I used a practice match, uh, or practice, I should say, the day before the match, and um, he used it to great effect on the on the on the pole, um, feeding hemp and uh, fishing, catching little skimmers, and holding it back. Um, again, great little float. There's the diagram. And a, a lovely float that does work. In fact, I was asked um, not so long ago uh, if I could get any. So. Um, that's uh, that's something in the pipeline. So as I say, go over to the website and have a look, and uh, uh, I'll keep you informed on that one. Now here's another um, running water pole float as well. Now this is uh, a round body. It's very similar to the um, uh, the onion float, uh, the waggler, but this is a, um, actually a pole float. And um, there yeah, I can see that. It's a round body type. Um, the shot in is quite uh, interesting because you've got a bulk and you've got a string of small shots below it. And um, this we learned of the uh, of the French, and they used it um, on, a, on a very on a small canal. Um, I was very impressed. They were holding it back against the pace of the quarter of the distance. Um, and as I said, the next time I saw it being uh, used, um, uh, then uh, it was. Um, uh, on the River Wye. I, I used one myself on the River Wye and, and uh, actually caught quite a few fish on it. So uh, there you are. So um, as I say, it counteracts the, the drift on the surface and um, so the, the business end underneath is uh, is actually uh, going with the flow with the current. So um, there you are. So a great little float. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I did. Oh, yes. There you are. <laughs> I'm just checking my records now. Um, I won a Gloucester Canal um, a uh, big Christmas open competition. Uh, that's right, I remember that, yes. And uh, and Kim Milson, uh, the old former um, England international, uh, next for one, and I beat him <laughs> on his own water uh, using that float. So it's a great little float, you know, the round body float. Um, so that's one to look out for as well. Of course, <laughs> over the years, my many years, I've got many experiences with all, the, all these floats. And that's why I can write about them and, uh, you know, and put them in, ma in the manual on the website and offer them for sale as well. I'm going to show you a float. I've mentioned this already on a rod and line float, but this one uh, is for the pole.
comes in many uh, different designs. And you may have seen them before. It's the lollipop float. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of uh, different sizes. Yeah, and that's that's basically to hold against. Uh, it acts like a rudder, see. Um, and it uh, you hold it against the. Uh, actually, tell you what's missing is the um, the bristles, which uh, which I need to um, put in inside. <laughs> Hang on, two secs. Okay, <laughs> right. Um, the reason I did, did have the bristles in is because they're interchangeable. You can actually take them out, so you can change the colours on them. Um, but you know, if I can show you roughly, it's wire stem coming from sort of uh, one side of the circle, and you've got another wire coming from the other side, which is going out at a ninety degree angle. Then you have your bristle, which is going at another forty five degree angle. Okay, so this is how you do. It. This is how you shot it. You basically put the rubbers, uh, put a rubber on. You put your line through there, and then a line on the on the um, uh, goes down through the uh, top of the wire. There's um, the rubber there. So you put the rubbers up, and you have another one on the bottom. And when you hold that back in the water, it basically writes itself, and you get your bristle just above the water level, and you can hold that perfectly still. It's slightly overshot in it, you know, um, depending on the flow. But um, you can get away with, um, you know, with quite a light uh, weight down, and this works absolutely fantastic. Um, as I say, so those are, uh, are we call a rudder float. Um, then I designed one, uh, the bat float, which is very similar. Um, again, uh, you overshot it slightly, hold it back, and that um, this one is more of a trotting one than a holding back one. But again, it's, uh, you know, it's quite a good one. And there's a, a later development then by a company called Caruso. And they have made it with, um, with, with a sort of a, a flute on it. So the water level runs over it. And again, you can hold it back um, in the uh, swim. Uh, I don't make these, uh, by the way, but uh, you have to buy these. Um, but there you are. Uh, it's on a winder, ready, <laughs> ready to go. But you can uh, see all the illustrations on my website or in the manual. Okay, well, that concludes the um, running water uh, pole floats. There, there are a couple of others as well, but uh, those are the main ones. Um, as I say, all the shapes, uh, there's a reason why uh, they're all aerodynamically shaped. It's mainly to hold against the flow or to go with the flow. Um, you know, whichever it is, again, um, it's something that, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about, go over to the website or better still buy the manual. It's all in the manual and explains more or less everything, uh, the history about the floats and everything else. Right. Um, on the next one, I'll be talking about still water uh, pole floats and also commercials uh, pole floats as well. So see you on the next one.